So without further ado, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome to UNM Taos and to introduce our chancellor candidate, Dr. Robin Kirkendall. Thank you, Anita. Welcome. I appreciate that warm welcome. Um, community members, uh, faculty, staff, um, students, if you're uh, here with us today, thank you so much for this opportunity. It is absolutely an um, amazing experience and so glad to be here with you today. So uh, a little bit about me, uh, kind of how I got here and why I'm interested in UNM Taos. Um, I have uh, two, over 21 years of experience in higher education. I have uh, what well, didn't plan on higher education career, and I actually had a little bit different uh, plan in mind. Um, I fell into higher education, but really fell in love with it once I found it. Uh, so like so many of our students today, I thought that I was going to go off to college. I had big aspirations and dreams. I had um, gotten a full ride scholarship to UNM of all places. And my goal was to be an attorney. Um, that was my lifelong dream. And so um, I, I was kind of set. Uh, but then life <laughs> happened, and I had to uh, kind of take a step back and regroup a little bit. Um, I turned my scholarship down, and then I went to the branch uh, college in my hometown, um, which is in New Mexico. I uh, did one semester there right out of high school, and then life happened again, and I had to uh, take uh, several semesters off. And this was really hard for me because uh, I was a first-generation college student. I was a, a first person in my family to go to college, and I just I had that deep desire and uh, the, a want to be able to get my education. And so I fought back and uh, came back uh, a couple of semesters later. Uh, was a non-traditional student, again, a first-generation college student, um, that I faced some significant equity gaps, uh, a lot of very similar to the ones that our students face today. And uh, one of those was socioeconomic. I had to work full-time in order to put myself through school. And I was fortunate enough to uh, get a full-time job as a secretary at the college where I was working or where I was attending. And uh, it's here that I discovered higher education. I was working in the transitional studies lab and I got to work uh, every day, one-on-one -on -one with students and helping them with math and English and reading. And I absolutely loved that. I loved the uh, ability to be able to make an impact on students. And sometimes it was just in that moment, uh, but sometimes uh, I, you just knew you were uh, really changing the trajectory of their entire lives. And that part was so rewarding to me. So that's really kind of where I got introduced to higher ed, um, but went on to main campus, got my bachelor's degree, got my master's degree in business administration. And then I moved to Clovis uh, when I uh, was uh, privileged enough to get a full-time teaching job at Clovis Community College. And I've shared before, um, I honestly thought that I would be a, an instructor forever because this is where I really fell in love with higher education. Um, just that impact that uh, faculty have on students every single day is, uh, was just, it, it was addicting. I loved that. I loved being able to not just help them uh, you know, impart content knowledge, but also being able to help them with life skills and the um, you know, work readiness and be able to um, help them overcome obstacles, but also try uh, uh, celebrate with them when they had triumphs as well. And so, um, so this is really where I think that my, um, I, I kind of had a shift. I, I, I no longer really felt like higher education was my career. I, I knew at this point that um, higher education was a calling for me. Um, and I think that happened because I had the opportunity to move into other positions and I didn't want to let that impact go, but I found that um, I wasn't letting that impact go. I really was actually changing the scope of it. I was actually able to impact uh, students in a completely different way. Um, and I was able to expand it. I could expand it into uh, my colleagues, into uh, peers, into the people around me, the institution as a whole and the community. And, and that's really where I uh, fell in love with um, the, the calling of higher education. And I knew that that was what my calling was. So um, the, uh, my experience itself, I think one of my greatest assets with my experience is the fact that I have been at every single level within um, higher, ed uh, higher education institution, a two-year school. Um, I've been that uh, student, the non-traditional student, that first-generation student. Uh, so I know what that's like. I know the obstacles that they face and, um, and how uh, those little small little victories, although seem small, are really huge in a student's mind. Um, so I've been there. I know that. 
Um, I've been a support staff member, um, and so I know how critical that support is for the overall um, academic process and student success process. I've been a faculty member, I've been a pro professional staff, I've been an administrator, and I've also been able to serve as interim president at my institution during our transition uh, when we were searching for a new president. So I literally have been at every single level within an institution. And I think that's one of, uh, again, one of the greatest assets that I can bring to the table. Um, because for UNM Taos, um, we're, we're really in unprecedented times uh, with everything that we're dealing with with COVID and with um, education itself. Um, to have a leader who uh, truly is uh, been at every level and can relate and be relevant to every uh, person, regardless of what level, um, students, uh, staff, and uh, faculty across the board, I think is such a powerful strength that UNM Taos uh, could have. And so, and I think I bring that to the table. So um, that's a little bit of my, the depth of my experience. Um, I also have a breadth of experience as well, um, academic, student affairs, um, and then also presidential. So I'll give you kind of a little bit of background on all three of those. As I mentioned, I was um, a full-time faculty member for 11 years at uh, my institution. And uh, as I had the opportunity to move into another role, um, I continued to teach. Uh, I, I wanted to continue to teach part time and I still do that today. Um, that's been really important for me throughout my career because um, it helps me stay connected. And I call that my uh, 360 connection um, because it allows me to stay connected at all levels, um, not just with my field of study, which is economics, uh, something that I also have a passion about. I have a passion about uh, education, but I also have a passion about economics. Um, and, but it allowed me to stay connected with the field of study, but also with students and faculty. And I see um, what students uh, go through um, on a daily basis. I see the obstacles. Um, and I know through COVID, uh, that's always that's been difficult. Um, and I shared earlier in the, the uh, student faculty staff forum, um, what our students have gone through during COVID is uh, remarkable. Um, I went through some very significant obstacles when I was going through school, but nothing like what students today are having to face. And so uh, they've pushed through, they've, uh, they've persevered. And I, I can honestly say that I think that um, our students today um, give uh, grit and perseverance a completely different meaning. So um, as a fellow educator, um, any, if we have any students that are here today, I want to let you know, um, I'm very proud of you. I know the UNM staff and faculty are proud of you as well, but as a fellow educator, I want you to know I'm proud of what you've accomplished because I know it hasn't been easy. Um, on the faculty side, um, I think it's very important to um, stay connected there as well. So um, staying connected with uh, the with assessment, with curriculum development, with uh, changes in modalities. Again, from the uh, uh, COVID perspective, we all had to make adjustments. So being able to stay connected on that front was extremely important. Um, and so that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what my uh, uh, teaching background is. Um, but I also have a lot of other background in academics as well. Um, I've had the, the privilege of being able to mentor faculty. So all of the things that I got to do as a faculty member, I was able to mentor faculty through those processes, um, mapping student learning objectives to assessment, closing that assessment feedback loop, dealing with uh, difficult classroom management, uh, tactics that they were that were struggling with. So all of those factors that, you know, sometimes, you know, for new faculty, but also um, tenured faculty and those who've been in the game for a long time, but might have run into a little bit of an obstacle. And so I had the, the privilege of being able to mentor faculty as a division chair. Um, but I also have experience on the programmatic side uh, for program evaluations, uh, developing new programs. I've developed several new ones. Um, I've also restructured uh, programs to um, help meet uh, industry needs and make sure that uh, those programs were aligned for student success, uh, success and completion. Um, I have experience on the accreditation side, um, about 16 or 17 years uh, of involvement with accreditation at my institution at varying levels. And so that academic experience really gives me a very broad perspective of the academic side. 
Um, but along with that, I also have the student affairs side. And I think that this is really something that's so important about uh, creating that well-rounded experience because I understand that the faculty and the student side of it and the academic component, but I can also see that complete onboarding process. Um, and that's what my current role is. I um, oversee student affairs. And uh, the four main areas that I oversee are dual credit and early college high school, um, admissions, financial aid, and academic advising, which includes our campus life activities and also our career services. And so what's great about that is just looking at the, um, the entire student uh, success journey from onboarding all the way to graduation. Uh, now, of course, I, I know that UNM's house is structured very differently. Um, those four areas that I oversee right now are actually split into three different departments at UNM Taos. And, and I actually love that that structure is very different from what I have because what it shows me about UNM Taos um, is how integrated you guys are. Um, it is something that uh, the, all of those areas actually are a huge component of that student success uh, journey, that process from onboarding to graduation. So the fact that you guys have those in three different areas helps show me that there is such a level of integration and teamwork that's really geared toward a student success. And I think that's such an important initiative moving forward. But it does give me, <clears throat> excuse me, the background to be able to understand um, how you guys are structured and then again, how that meets the overall mission of the institution. I'm gonna take a break, uh, drink water real quick. While she's doing that, I wanna thank you all for submitting your questions. There's some really wonderful ones uh, coming through here. Please continue to submit and we will get through as many as we uh, can in the time allowed. Thank you for that break. Um, I've been talking all day, so um, I needed to take a little bit uh, of a break there. Uh, so um, looking at my, that's my uh, student affairs experience, um, but then I was also privileged to be able to serve as um, interim president at my institution uh, during our transition. I mentioned that earlier. Um, this was a competitive search, uh, internal search process. Uh, our president moved on to Santa Fe Community College and our board of trustees opened that up for an internal search. There were five of us that I was selected by the board of trustees. And this was a hard decision for me um, because the board made uh, a very strict stipulation that anybody who applied for the interim position could not apply for uh, the full-time position. And so I had to really weigh out uh, which direction I wanted to go. And I knew that I had a really strong opportunity in front of me with the interim position. Um, and so there's really two main reasons why I decided to go that route um, and apply for interim. One was um, I saw the, um, the apprehension and the anxiety that uh, the faculty and staff at my institution were facing because of this transition. And I know many people in uh, our institution and even in the community um, may be feeling that as well. Anytime you get a new leader coming in, it's hard it's difficult to know um, what it's gonna be like and is this person going to fit in and are they going to carry through with the, the culture and the current initiatives that are in place within the institution. And that can be, uh, change is difficult, change is very difficult. And so I wanted to be, um, be there for my faculty and staff and I knew that I was the best person to lead them through that. So I, that's one of the big reasons why I um, applied for the position. The second one is I really wanted to kind of explore and see if this is something that I wanted to do. I wasn't sure if a presidential position is what I wanted, um, but what I discovered um, is that I absolutely loved it. Um, it was an amazing experience, um, probably the hardest thing that I've ever done, but the most rewarding um, because it provided so many opportunities to be able to make a difference within the institution and the community for our industry partners as well. And so um, I loved the legislative experience. I got firsthand experience with our legislators and being up at Roundhouse, and that was amazing. And so um, I'm grateful to have that particular experience. But what it, it showed me is that I really, it, it's something that I want to do. And so I feel as though my academic background, my student affairs background, and then that holistic uh, experience as a president of an independent community college really gives me a very strong background to be chancellor for UNM Taos because I think it gives you a well-rounded person moving forward. So that's a little bit about me. Um, uh, why am I interested in UNM Taos? I think that the best way to sum that up is with one theme, and that's uh, the opportunity to make a difference. 
Um, I'm just that person. That's kind of who I am. It's ingrained in me. Um, it doesn't matter where I go or what I'm doing. I'm always looking for where's the opportunity to make a difference for this group or for that person or for this organization. And I see so much of that here at UNM Taos. And um, I'll take just a few minutes to kind of highlight a, key, a couple of the key things um, that I see as opportunities to make a difference and what is such a draw to me to uh, UNM Taos. And um, I think the first one is uh, COVID. Um, I, I think that's a big one that we're all facing right now. And um, we're definitely not post COVID yet, uh, but we're, we've made a lot of strides and we're getting so much closer. And so I think that as we're getting to that point right there, um, we have some opportunities to make a difference. Um, you know, I touched on a, a minute ago with the students. Um, students, you guys have uh, overcome so much during this uh, COVID time. And, um, and that's remarkable. Um, the faculty and staff, I look at what you guys have done as well. And I think as a nation, we don't give our uh, educational faculty and staff uh, as much credit as they deserve during this pandemic. Um, we have a hard job. Uh, education is a very hard job. Um, we are educating tomorrow's future and what you guys have done um, to be adaptable and to uh, push on and to continue educating and providing quality education um, is amazing. And so as I look at that, as we're getting closer to post-COVID, um, I see it as an opportunity for us together as a team, a team within UNM's house to be able, and the community, to be able to reimagine what higher education is going to look like. Um, we can say that we would like things to get back to normal, but honestly, um, it's going to be a new normal. There's a lot of things that uh, we've encountered through COVID that uh, we uh, may want to keep. Um, and a lot of things we're like, oh, I don't, I don't necessarily want to hope we don't have to do that forever. Um, but it does bring about an opportunity for us to really, again, reimagine what higher education looks like as we move forward. And I think to be able to be part of a great team like the UNM Taos and Taos community to do that would be an absolute honor. So that's, uh, that's one area. I think the other area that draws me to UNM's house um, is the diversity. Um, my background, I'm rural New Mexico. All of my experiences in rural New Mexico, um, I have uh, all of my experiences working at a, a Hispanic serving institution, uh, so very similar to what UNM's house is. And so I understand diversity. I understand what uh, the obstacles are and uh, you know what, what a diverse population faces. Um, but uh, Taos is different. Um, it has a very unique uh, uh, diversity, and a lot of that um, comes together with Taos Pueblo and the uh, Hispanic population, just the culture and the heritage that's within those groups um, is amazing. And what I love about Taos is it, it integrates, it embodies and embraces that culture and that heritage as part of what Taos is all about. And I think that that diversity and that uh, provides a lot of opportunities. Uh, I can be together with a lot of people um, who are exactly like me, but I'm gonna have a very small um, impact. I'm not gonna be able to make much of a difference. Where I'm able to make a difference is when I'm with a group, within an organization or a community that is diverse. And so with a, a Taos having that level of diversity, I see a lot of opportunities um, to be able to make a difference um, being embedded in the community here. Um, I think another area that is important to me and why I'm interested in UNM Taos is um, innovation and growth. Um, I've uh, kind of watched uh, the uh, innovation and the growth over the last 11, 12 years of what UNM Taos has done. And it's amazing. It's pretty remarkable. And what that tells me is that you guys have a culture of innovation that is uh, uh, extremely strong. And it provides a level of sustainability moving forward. Um, and for a person like me, I'm very much of a visionary, a strategic leader that is uh, for, very forward thinking. That's uh, extremely uh, enticing to me because I know that you have that culture and that foundation for innovation and growth and uh, that you're willing to to take that foundation and move to, to bigger platforms. So I think that that's a, uh, another opportunity to make a difference. Um, I think the community, um, I'm very much of a, a community-based person. Um, I'm highly involved in my community at home. Um, I'm part of the Eastern Area Workforce Development Board, um, a part of a, a very collaborative uh, co-county initiative with United Way 
to build uh, youth services, uh, specifically in the career technical and uh, career pathways um, opportunities for our youth. So highly involved in that. Um, and I see so much of those opportunities within uh, Taos County as well. And then um, I think probably the final thing, if I have just another minute, is more of a personal uh, reason why I'd like to come to, uh, to Taos. Um, my family and I have been coming here for about 18 years. Um, this is a place we love, um, a place that uh, we've always dreamed about. You know, when we retire, this is the, the destination and the place we want to be. And the idea of being able to be in a place that we love and uh, can get involved in the community and be a part of the culture that is here um, while still doing the calling that I have, which is higher education, uh, would be absolutely amazing. And so I think uh, from that perspective, those are the key things that I think uh, kind of draw me to, to UNM Taos and to the Taos community itself, because I really feel like there's really opportunities to make a difference there. Excellent. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction and opening remarks. I think you've really uh, given our attendees today um, a great overview of both the breadth and the depth of your experience and also some of the personal reasons why you're exploring this opportunity. So thank you. So we'll uh, get started with our, our first questions. Um, Again, so we're, um, this session is open to the community. So there are a lot of questions about how we engage as a, a college in, in the community. Uh, and I do also wanna recognize that we have several community members that are with us today. Uh, District Attorney Marcus Montoya, thank you for being with us, Mr. Montoya. And we also have a couple county commissioners that are joining us. So thank you, Commissioner Vic Hill, Darlene Vick Hill is with us, as well as Commissioner Brush, and Jeanette Brush is joining us. Thank you both. So the first question is, UNM Taos is very visible in the community. How do you plan on integrating into our community as a chancellor? So that is uh, something that uh, is kind of a, a passion for me. I love being part of the community itself. So I think it's critical for uh, the, the chancellor in this position to do that. And I think it would come natural for me because it's something that I do already, um, but it's being involved. It's um, being involved with um, not just the, the uh, state and legislators and the city commissioners and the, those types of things, but also what activities are going on. Um, where can we um, partner together to find opportunities within the Taos community and with UNM Taos to make this a better area? Um, to uh, provide opportunities for our students, for our community members, so those kinds of things. So um, a community involvement, I think, is uh, extremely important um, and something that uh, is very, I'm very passionate about. I think that's how you build relationships. I think that's how you find those opportunities that um, are available for, for our students in our community. And so it's something that I honestly would, you know, hope to be able to get started in right away uh, if I were selected as a chancellor. Excellent. Thank you so much. So uh, current technical education and workforce development has been a, a big topic of our discussions today. Uh, and this is asking about how you would strengthen current UNM Child's initiatives in CTE and workforce development that are so crucial to a healthy community and economy. A great question. So um, career technical education is something that um, I have a very strong background in it. And I, I really have um, uh, I, I'm, I really am very data driven and very um, industry based need. Um, I'm always looking at those specific factors to see what is it that our community needs, what are our industry needs, and how can we create um, some sustainable programs that allow us to satisfy those needs. Um, but they have to be um, really looking at collaborative efforts. Um, because I, I can come up with some good ideas on my own, but um, really it's a, about being involved within the community, within those industry partners to say, where can we make a difference and where are the greatest needs? What are our high wage, high demand uh, jobs that are available and can we bridge that gap? Um, so actually I have quite a bit of experience um, in career technical education. I'll, I'll kind of give a little bit of a highlight of an initiative that I uh, spearheaded with, uh, within our region. Um, as I mentioned before, um, I have been a part of dual credit uh, for a long time. I um, have 27 partners, high school partners across the state, um, and then there's nine schools within Region I. 
And uh, I was working, I know you guys are a Perkins institution, um, just like we are. And I was working with um, our uh, community and our, our secondary partners, our industry partners in you know, some uh, CTE initiatives. And New Mexico PED really wanted to take a completely different approach with Perkins this past year um, and really making it more industry driven. So had a lot of regional meetings and some of you may have been a part of that. Um, but one of the things that I noticed as I was in those industry meetings was that there was um, a lot of rural schools that were not going to be able to participate um, because they just didn't have the resources to be able to do that. And so um, I approached PED with, a, with an opportunity to kind of create a, a consortia that really allowed us to um, meet the needs of some of these rural schools. My biggest concern when we look at that are um, equity gaps. Um, that means that if uh, these rural schools weren't able to participate, that there were going to be students that didn't have the same CTE opportunities that others did. And so we work together to build this consortia that allows uh, uh, our institution to be able to kind of be the fiscal agent to farm out to uh, the, develop these programs within schools to create those career technical education opportunities right within the high schools. And so, and this has been a huge success, something that um, we have a lot of support from New Mexico PED on, um, and something that, you know, is, you know, an opportunity to look at here as well. But I think the big thing with career technical education is being industry minded, talking to industry partners, finding out what those needs are, having a collaborative effort that looks at how can we build some CTE programs that allow us to build some high demand, high wage jobs for our students that create a level of sustainability. Excellent. Thank you so much. So a similar question around um, workforce, economic development and diversification of the economy. Uh, Taos is seen as an art destination and uh, known around the country as a destination for outdoor recreation. How would you let the world know that Taos is also an education destination? Well, I think a uh, part of that comes to, um, you know, my economic background that um, uh, I, I think the arts component and the, uh, you know, vacation destination is a great aspect of Taos, but I think it offers so much more than that. Um, I know that UNM Taos provides a $7 million economic impact to Taos County, and that's huge. And that all comes from an educational institution and what uh, the partnership that UNM Taos, Taos has with the community. And that's important. Um, so I think it's about um, you know, working with the community um, and cultivating those opportunities and those uh, programs to be able to say, how are we going to meet those, uh, those industry needs? And how do we provide that customized training, the, the on-the-job training, those things that meet the industry side of it? Um, I've been part of the uh, Eastern Area Workforce Development Board for the last two years, and that's a big part of what we've been doing. So um, very familiar with WIOA, very familiar with um, the uh, customized training and the youth services uh, initiatives um, that are going on across the state. And I think that that's something that is going to be very valuable for moving forward, because it's not just uh, the, uh, we, we have to keep the entire workforce in mind as we're looking at our educational opportunities. So to help people know that we're not just an art destination, I think it's about being um, in the community and helping to show that economic impact that UNM Taos has on the, the county itself and what opportunities are there to be able to move forward um, with the, the community partners. Excellent. Thank you so much. So considering what you know and the research that you've done about campus and the community, what program or degree would you like to see UNM Taos offer that we don't currently provide uh, that might support economic and workforce development? Something that you don't offer. Um, so I think that um, a couple of areas that I would like to explore um, as I would like to explore some career technical education options um, in the welding area and um, automotive area and um, the uh, allied health. Um, I think that there may be some other opportunities in that area as well. Um, we, I just uh, finished a program gap analysis um, and we, we do most of the, you know, most of the counties that we looked at from an economic perspective on that side were 
um, in the southeastern area where we're located, but I also included a lot of northern counties um, in, in this, this Taos area. And a couple of the things that were uh, prominent in terms of program gaps, the, the three big things that came out were um, healthcare um, assistance, uh, automotive, and also uh, education. So early college high school, or not early college high school, um, ECE, um, uh, and, uh, and education, like a, one, a two plus two type of uh, approach. And so I think I would look at those particular programs. I know that uh, UNM Taos offers a, an education program that allows a general transfer, but I think um, with the, the national teacher shortage, I, I, I think I would want to explore that opportunity as how can we um, as a system be able to bring um, some of those educational opportunities to the Taos area. Geographic obstacles are things that a lot of our students are going to face, and so a lot of students may not be able to transfer on to uh, a to UNM to be able to get that degree? And is there a way that we might be able to bridge that gap with um, the, uh, the entire UNM system to be able to offer those additional two years uh, within this area? And I think it would be could, a great partnership with the other uh, branches of UNM. Uh, I, so I think that's one area. Um, I think, again, looking at the, the industry uh, component that uh, I've I found through this program gap analysis um, is examining the automotive and see if that is an option. I know CDL is uh, something that you guys have had. Um, so looking at that thing, uh, that particular program and is there um, a, a continued need for that option as well. Um, so I think those may be a couple of the things right off the bat. Great ideas, thank you. So this next question um, is, a, is a little bit long and I'm happy to repeat it if necessary. So while acknowledging the diverse literate and linguistic practices and strengths of our population, New Mexico ties for last in the nation in terms of adult literacy rates. So the question is, what do you believe the role of the community colleges in providing adult literacy education, not only for those pursuing a high school equivalency or higher education, but for community members with various literacy goals? Uh, well, it, it's a community college, and I strongly believe that we're here to serve the community. So whether that is um, to gain those literacy skills to go on um, to uh, further their education, I think we're in the business of education. And so to provide those adult education opportunities for uh, literacy um, help impact our overall community, um, because if we can get... Uh, um, our population um, at a higher literacy rate, um, then we've just enriched our community as a whole. So I think that we have kind of an obligation um, to look at education as a, a come from a holistic perspective, not just uh, degree completers, um, but also, I mean, obviously that is extremely important, but also looking at what is the needs of the overall community. Um, some students are gonna want to do a general transfer degree and be able to move on. Some are looking for a career technical education that gives them skills that allows them to go straight to work. Others are looking for, you know, I just, I mean, you just need a bridge. I need one class, a computer class that kind of helps elevate me in my job. Some are looking for hobbyist things. Um, and so I think it's a really important as a uh, community college to be able to embrace all of that. And I think reading literacy is huge um, because it helps continue to foster that education within our community and it helps to enrich the community as a whole. Thank you so much. This next question is multi-part. First, how do you define shared governance? Then if you can give an example where shared governance was a critical component of your decision-making process and or implementation of a complex strategy. Conversely, in what conditions might you avoid using shared governance? Okay, so first question was, how do I view shared governance? Um, well, I think shared governance is um, allowing um, all stakeholders um, that are involved to have a voice um, and to be able to uh, bring something to the table. And I think that is extremely important uh, because, um, and I think I mentioned earlier, I can't remember if it's in this forum or in a different one, um, but I have good ideas, but my ideas alone are not necessarily great ideas. It's when you um, look at that uh, shared governance approach, um, you, you really create a holistic perspective of things. So I think it's really important to allow all stakeholders to have that 
opportunity to be able to voice. Um, there are times when, uh, you know, it might not be, of course, if it's, uh, you know, a, a policy that's, you know, sensitive policy that you're looking at um, implementing, you may not be able to include every single person in that decision making. Um, and so I think you have to be sensitive of, you know, legal concerns. You have to be sensitive of, you know, you know sensitive information. And so I think that um, you just have, you have to be mindful of, you know, there are certain times when you might not be able to open up a decision for everyone to make. Um, the other thing too is being in a role um, of like a chancellor, you, you have to make some hard decisions and you, you wanna look at gathering as much input as possible, um, but ultimately you have to be able to make uh, decisions that are best for the institution, um, best for the faculty and staff as a whole and not looking at one particular um, um, individual or one particular group, that type of thing. So I think it's important to have that shared governance piece in place um, because everyone should have a voice. And I think we're together stronger than uh, we are by ourselves. Um, at the same time, uh, you do have to have um, a, a level of uh, confidentiality. Uh, there's times when, you know, uh, my ad, uh, admin group that I'm part of, you know, there's things that stay within that group because they are sensitive and it, it has to operate that way. Um, at the same time, um, you do open that up for, for other constituency feedback whenever it's possible. I think transparency is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we're going to move from uh, the micro level of campus and community into a more global question, which is uh, if you can talk about what you think are the most pressing issues and challenges being faced by community colleges across the country and what you think the future looks like maybe five years from now. That's a really good question. So I think a couple, um, two of the main things that I think that are uh, nationwide of concerns within higher education and in two-year institutions um, is the changes in dem demographics. Um, we, you know, we have a steady decline in enrollments, and that's real. I mean, it's 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 really a difficult uh, uh, obstacle that we're facing. And I know COVID has exacerbated that, um, but we really were kind of on a, a little bit of a downhill slide, and a lot of that has to do with um, the changing population. And you know, demographics has changed, um, and we just don't have quite that population base um, for. Uh, uh, students coming in and the number of high school students who are graduating from high school and that, that number attending high school is lower. And so obviously that's going to change the number of uh, students that are going into higher education. So I think that is something uh, that downward trend and enrollment is a, a real obstacle. Um, and that's something that people are facing across the board. Of course, COVID has made that a little bit more difficult um, and has, you know, it's gone down even more. Um, but I think that at the same time, there's some, some definite opportunities within that. I think it, it makes us stop and reevaluate some of the things that we're doing. And are we looking at things from a different vantage point? I think oftentimes um, we keep moving forward um, and thinking that you know the way we're doing things uh, is working. Um, but anytime we're in a situation like this where we have lower enrollment or a pandemic like this, we really have to stop and say, maybe we need to do a 360 view of that and look at that from a little bit different vantage point and see, are there other opportunities that we might be able to capitalize on? And I think that there is uh, an entire population that is, um, you know, going to see, especially coming out post COVID, that is going to see a huge need um, um, in education and the need to be able to uh, be a part of an institution that gives them an opportunity to have a sustainable um, career and option moving forward. So I, I do think that there's some opportunity that comes with it. I think that, um, what was the second part of that? I think I lost my train of thought. Uh, what would be an example of when you have used shared governance to, I'm sorry, no, I'm on the wrong question. There's one other piece of it that I didn't cover. Sorry, I lost no, no, that's okay. Um, we were on the most pressing issues, and what do you think the future looks like? Okay, I see. Um, I think the other issue um, is student debt. Talked about this with um, a group this morning, and I, I think so many of our students are 
facing um, a lot of debt, um, even in a community college setting. And I, I think financial literacy is a huge, uh, important component moving forward, helping students to understand what uh, obstacles, uh, additional obstacles they may face um, by having a, a a, a large student debt that goes along with their education. Um, and so looking at the opportunities to be able to provide um, financial aid and scholarships and partnering with uh, the community for uh, stronger foundation opportunities uh, to again, increase those funds. Um, the textbook affordability, um, I think is something, uh, that's something that came up in our last forum. And I, I think looking at opportunities for uh, students to be able to have you know, more cost-effective options um, within their education. And so um, I think those are a really important um, things that we need to be looking at as a nation. Um, and again, opportunities to do something different. Uh, so I, every time I, we see an obstacle, I, I know that there's always an opportunity to be able to look at that from a different vantage point. It gives us uh, something that we might be able to be innovative about and be able to move forward to provide for our students. Thank you so much. So I think one of the best questions that I've seen just came through, which is from a staff member asking us if we need umbrellas for the tour this afternoon. Uh -huh. So I just wanted to share that and just have a quick sense of, of what our campus and our community is like. So, so full <laughs> disclosure, I did ask the doctor, I was watching the, the radar and I asked Dr. Malm this morning, I'm like, am I going to need my umbrella? He says, no, we're going to keep you very sheltered. It's going to be fine. So I do have an umbrella in my vehicle, but unfortunately it's in my vehicle and not here with me. Well, we have four that are coming on the way. So um, <laughs> thanks to the amazing teamwork that we have. Um, so the next question is uh, if you can talk about your leadership style and how do you envision your first six months at UNM Tufts? Oh, great question. So my leadership style, very much of a visionary strategic leader. Um, I am really good at seeing big picture and a very forward thinking. I'm always looking at where are the opportunities for us to be able to enhance our student success opportunities, to make a difference within the community, to meet those industry needs. Is there an equity gap that we want to shore up and try to improve? So I'm always looking at that kind of stuff. And so very much of a visionary leader, um, but I'm also very strategic at the same time. I, I'm really good at seeing big picture, um, but I'm also very good at those details. And I think that becomes extremely critical um, because when you're working with a team and you're trying to impart uh, a vision within a team, um, you want to make sure that you're able to help the team, you know, work through that. And to get that buy-in, it's having an understanding of what those little details are and how they can move through that. Um, that when they do run into obstacles, um, how can you work through that with them? Um, I was shared earlier this morning, I have um, a, a big project that we're working on right now, and I had um, a great buy-in from, from my team, but uh, one of my uh, directors came back and is just, she was very stumped. She's like, I do, I'm just, I've got a block. I don't know how to move forward. And, um, you know, my approach to that kind of stuff is to walk through that with my team to say, I, I'm, I'm good about lead, asking leading questions and just kind of try to help guide them through um, because I want them to be able to come up with those ideas on their own, but I know that they're not always able to. So how can I ask them, uh, how can I ask leading questions that help them to kind of arrive at that decision? Um, and I may know where I um, think that they should go, um, but allowing them to get there on their own by asking those leading questions, I, I has found is a really uh, a great tactic about uh, um, helping them, you know, continue continue on with that vision. And so from that perspective, very much of a visionary and strategic leader. Uh, but I'm also very collaborative. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, I have good ideas. Um, and again, I'm very visionary, um, very strategic, but at the same time, I recognize that my ideas are only good, they're not great. It's not until I can pull a diverse group of people um, to the table and create, get all of those creative juices flowing that uh, we can really come up with a great initiative and opportunity to move forward. So um, very much of uh, both of those types of leaders. So I think there was a second part to that question. Did I miss it? Uh, what would your first six months look oh, six, like? Oh, my first six months. Um, you know what? I think the biggest thing is building relationships. I think it, the, the first part of it is going to be um, looking at, you know, 
uh, embedding within the institution itself and getting to know the faculty and staff and the students. And I think that is extremely important. Um, to start with, um, but also getting involved in the community, getting to know the, the city officials, getting to know the, the legislators, getting to know the different uh, industry and business owners. How can I, you know, look at, you know, embedding within the community to find out, you know, what is going on at uh, Taos and in UNM Taos. I have, um, you know, I, I, I really kind of one of those people that I don't, um, until I know what's going on, until I've had an opportunity to ask, so what are you doing? How are things going? Are you running into obstacles? Um, I'm not the kind of person to jump in and do a bunch of changes. I want to get to know what the structure is and what, what the culture is first, build those relationships and build that rapport first. So I see that as the first portion um, of uh, what I would do if I were selected as chancellor. And then from there, being able to come back in a collaborative fashion to be able to say, what are our current projects? What resources do we need? Are there any gaps? Do we need to look at some more resources to be able to move those initiatives forward the way we need to? And then are there other some emerging uh, initiatives that we want to look at? Uh, I think it's a really important that everything that we do uh, be aligned with what our mission is. Um, and, and I know that a big part of that quality education and economic vitality, but um, also uh, when we're looking at that strategic priorities and building those priorities is are they aligned with uh, what that mission is. Um, and then, of course, the overall UNM system. I think it's also being mindful of, I know UNM's got their, their new uh, uh, initiative now in 2040. And I think that it's important to be able to look at that entire approach to make sure that we're all moving kind of in that same direction. So uh, relationship building and rapport is number one. Excellent. Thank you so much for that response. So we have time for uh, probably a couple more questions. Uh, this next one is... Um, a combination of a couple uh, that might make sense in the interest of time. So how can educational technologies support students to academic success and ultimately college completion, particularly for students that need remediation or face uh, issues with computer use? So how can educational technology technologies for students that need remediation or may have a lower uh, computer literacy. So I, I think that anytime but we're in a technological age, and so I think anytime we can incorporate technology into that educational process, I think it's extremely important. Um, but I think it's also important, especially with someone who uh, may um, have a little bit of a literacy gap. Um, I think it's important to still have that uh, human connection. Um, so I, I, I would look at that as how do we uh, kind of build uh, those um, items together. But I think what's great about educational technology is it allows uh, students to work at their own pace. It allows, um, you know, a student who might be able to move through that uh, you know, educational technology a little bit faster, um, the ability to do that so that they can jump into, you know, some college level classes or they can, you know, uh, whatever their next goal is. Um, but then someone who might need a little bit of extra time, be able to have uh, some technology that allows them to, you know, work at their pace as well. But I think that human connection, especially at that level, is extremely important as well. Absolutely. Thank you. When you have multiple critical needs, but limited available funds to move forward, what is your thought process for deciding which initiative to pursue? Okay, so I think this one, um, the, and unfortunately we run into this all the time, um, there's never enough resources to do everything that we want to do, unfortunately. And so um, you have to look at what the um, higher priorities are. And so um, if I were selected as UNM, uh, uh, Taos Chancellor, um, the first thing I would do is pull in the admin team um, to talk to them about um, the, uh, the priorities and where, how can we prioritize each of these initiatives? What are the ones that are critical to the student success process and to the faculty side to make sure that they are um, have what they need to be able to ensure that students are successful? And then from there, build a priority list that allows us to address some of those critical funding components. And then maybe look at what are some you know, creative resource options that we can look at to maybe pull in some of the others. Um, so I think from an, uh, from an imminent standpoint, of course, we would have to prioritize, but then I think we also have to look outside our, you know, step outside our comfort zone and look at what other funding options might be available. 
one of the things that I found is um, extremely beneficial when we're looking at funding resources um, and opportunities is looking within the, the community and the industry to be able to find those uh, opportunities where it's mutually beneficial for both the institution and for the business itself. Um, I found that those are the best ways to um, create some of those uh, uh, funding opportunities and that might help uh, alleviate some of that financial uh, gaps that we might face. Excellent. Thank you so much. So there's one question I want to close with, but there's a couple more that have come in. How do you envision integrating cultural and historical elements, such as acequias and land grants of Taos, and validating their importance in an educational journey at UNHS? Well, I think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think that some of those those cultural aspects are part of what makes Taos uh, so amazing. It, it gives that uh, richness. So I think those uh, type of opportunities through land grants um, are really are an opportunity to be able to um, look at how we can expand the 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 cultural offerings and the the way in which we bring that those cultural things to the community. So I think anytime we can have um, you know um, uh, an opportunity like that, some additional funding sources, um, even on the cultural side, is where are our needs within our community? Where are our um, the desires? How are we meeting the needs of our community members? Um, so definitely be able to pull in some things like that. Excellent, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last question, and this is probably the most important question that you will be asked throughout your whole process, is red or green? Oh, green. <laughs> green it is. Green. I love them both, but green, you can't go wrong with green chili at all. <laughs> And there's really no wrong answer. There, there is no wrong answer. answer but. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking time with us today. Uh, it was really wonderful to, to learn more about you and hear your approach and your perspective about uh, the chancellor position at UNM House and the community. I want to thank all of you for joining us as well to learn more about chancellor candidate uh, Dr. Robin Kirkendall. I encourage you to fill out the, um, the feedback survey that's provided, been provided by the provost office. I'll enter it here in the chat in a moment. Uh, if you've missed any of the uh, Chancellor Public Forums, they have been recorded. They will be posted on that same website. However, out of fairness to each of our candidates, we'll wait till after the, the last candidate has uh, conducted their public forums before we post any of those recordings on the website. So the, uh, the site I'll post in the chat, you can go there for additional information about the candidates. Uh, to fill out the, uh, the feedback survey and uh, after next week to watch the, um, the recordings. Thanks again for joining us. I do also, before we close, would like to thank our uh, search committee chair, uh, Dr. James Mall, the chancellor for UNM Gallup, who has worked hard throughout this process to keep it moving forward and help bring us uh, amazing finalists. And he also has the opportunity to serve as the the host for Dr. Kirkendall today. So thank you, Dr. Mull, for all of your, your work and contributions to this process. Uh, before we close, I'm going to make sure I get the link here in the chat, uh, and we will look forward to seeing you uh, next time. And there you are. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.